I don't really succumb to what whatever the business has to offer. I just, you know, I'm I do my own thing. Mike Dent and Billy Joe had been friends uh, at school in Rodeo uh, since they were about 11 years old. Um, and they just kind of fell into being a band. I think they'd had several incarnations of bands. The only one I name I can remember offhand is Blood Rage, which was a sort of a metal or death metal kind of band. And, you know, none of it really got anywhere, but obviously they were all that time they were learning to play together and to write together. All reports of, of Billy Joe from his school teachers and whatnot basically say that he was basically a good kid, a nice kid, not necessarily a, a terrific student in the academic sense, but a bright kid and a good kid and everybody liked him. We started our band, we never thought in a million years that we would end up where we are right now because it was anyone before us, it never happened, so, you know. Uh, I, I interviewed Billy a few years ago for a, a magazine article. You know, he, he told me well, partly about his, his father being a, a musician and his, his mother working really, really hard after his father died just to, just to survive. And it's just something that really drove him to, to, to do something with his life. And yet, at the same time, he didn't have a whole lot of other skills besides music. I mean, he told me, you know, many times, you know, I don't know what else I would do or could do if, if I didn't play music. Billy Joe actually left high school um, just a few months before he was due to graduate. And there's a story there where he sort of had to, he had to go and see the principal to get a sign formed which released him from high school and he said, you know, I'm leaving to do music and the principal just said, who are you? He didn't even recognise him. So he'd obviously made a big impression at school, I think. Because they were so young, I mean, they were 15 years old uh, when they formed the Sweet Children. And that's, I guess, kind of what they were. I would imagine it was sort of an ironic choice of name. Because, you know, they were like 15-year-old boys in cheap sort of thrift store clothes, bad haircuts, drinking lots, smoking weed and stuff. So, uh, but they had a song called Sweet Children. And I guess it, maybe it was like to preempt any criticism they would get at shows. Because, you know, young bands get given quite a hard time older punks will be thinking, you know, who are these young upstarts? So it's probably tongue-in-cheek, sarcastic choice of name, really. I think by the time they met up with, uh, with Al or John, um, it was just, you know, waiting to happen. They just, that, was, that was the missing ingredient. I mean, he not only had kind of the organizational abilities, but he also had the connections the, and the inspiration to say, hey, we don't need to, like, you don't need to sit here rehearsing and making all these demos and stuff. There's, there's already a punk scene you can just go play. Well, it's quite hard for a young band to get shows, particularly in America more so than in the UK because of the licensing laws. You know, a lot of places you've got to be 21 and they're really strict on ID. But the sort of the benefit for Green Day was that they were part of the punk scene. They were part of a, a, a punk rock community that, were, that is really very different from, from any other and that it's the Northern Californian punk rock community. We're sometimes called NoCal punk rock community as opposed to the SoCal, which is the Southern Californian. The Southern Californian scene, which really was the kind of the early 80s, was really clubs, over 21 clubs. Uh, there were all ages show, but it was kind of a very violent, uh, nihilistic kind of scene. Um, very exciting, but it kind of burnt out inevitably. Conversely, the, the Northern Californian scene was kind of, was kind of an ideology that, 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 although the punks might not care to hear this, it was really almost like a hippie ideology and it was very communal 
And so there were places for bands to play, there were parties for bands to play. So they could go and play these places like community halls, diners, and they wouldn't have to be ID'd. And it was just a, it was more playing shows for their peers and other bands, lots of, lots of punk bands, rather than going into a bar and playing to a bunch of sort of drunk rock fans. It was playing to people who were there for the music or part of the punk scene rather than, you know, the, the, the alcohol scene, if you like. When they found that there was a place that they could play instead of, you know, in the garage or the basement all the time, I think that just kind of set them free. It was just so exciting to, you know, to be that age and all of a sudden have hundreds of kids out there saying, hey, this is great, we like you. So that, on top of their undeniable talent and their dedication, you know, I think that kind of kick-started them and sent them into orbit. They were school kids, they really played for their friends and for the hell of it, but, but all reports that, that I can certainly discover regarding those gigs is that they were already very good at that time. They were already, they already had something about them. They had some kind of sense of stuff. Trey grew up um, in a sort of uh, quite remote mountain town in California called Willits which is sort of a mountain area well known for its marijuana produce and the fact that lots of sort of old hippies live there. Well, his father flew helicopters in Vietnam. When he left Vietnam, I think he wanted to pursue the quiet life in the countryside. So Trey grew up in the middle of nowhere, really. His nearest neighbour was a mile away, and that was Larry Livermore of the Lookouts, which is how he first started drumming. My band needed a drummer, and the nearest the closest thing I could find to a drummer was this crazy kid that lived about a mile down the road. Um, he was 12 at the time, had never played drums in his life, but he was a big show-off and a, had, a, had a big mouth and I guess what you'd call charisma for a 12-year-old anyway. And somehow I got it into my head, well, he might be a good drummer. And I asked him to come over and uh, try his hand at the drums. And he wasn't, he wasn't half bad. He had a lot of enthusiasm and he could keep a beat. His name, his uh, nickname was Trey anyway, because he was the third in his family with the same name. And I just said, well, you need a, a punk rock name now, so you're going to be Trey Cool. And that was, uh, you know, as, as we know, he turned out a few years later to, to be Green Day's drummer. But for the first five years uh, of his punk rock career, he was playing in my band, The Lookouts. We didn't start playing down in uh, San Francisco or, or Berkeley or Oakland until about, oh, probably a year and some after we'd formed. And that just came about because I'd, I'd been going down there for shows. It was about almost 200 miles away, but I'd, I'd go down for, for punk rock gigs occasionally. It was the only place to, that you could find them at that time. And sort of by talking to people, I ended up getting our band invited to, to play at one of them. And, and from then on, we, we, we'd go down about once a month to the, to the Bay Area and got a, I'd, I wouldn't say a great reception, but a much better reception than we'd been getting up in the mountains. And that's how, that's how we sort of began to become integrated into the, into the Bay Area scene. There'd be a, a place called Gilman Street, known as the Gilman Street Project, which was uh, a, a, a no alcohol, all ages room on Gilman Street in Berkeley that was founded by a guy called Tim Johanahan and he used to edit um, a punk magazine called Maximum Rock and Roll. So was this, there was this great community. There was a lot of localism at the time where they, a lot of people felt like there was all this local talent that didn't have any place to play and by having this place suddenly that people were able to create, um, a lot of people came out of the woodwork, a lot of people that had been around were able to focus on that, and it had a kind of a unifying effect. 
Gilman Street was kind of a coming together of several scenes. It was, you know, the, the punk scene has always kind of had factions. And for, for most of the time, they barely even speak to each other. But occasionally, and Gilman Street was one of those occasions, they all come together in a common enterprise and agree to tolerate each other for a greater purpose. And that was kind of what was happening in 87, 88, 89 at, at Gilman. There was kind of an uneasy truce between all these people, and it made this really cool grassroots scene possible. When the band had been playing for about a year, I thought, well, I know how to make a fanzine. How, how much harder can it be to put out records? So I'll put out a record by my band. And that was, although I didn't realize it at the time, uh, the beginning of the label. Lookout Records was a label that put out a lot of the records, mostly singles, uh, not too many albums, by the early crop of bands that were playing Gilman Street. This is a label that's getting run out of my bedroom. And when I say bedroom, I mean my only room. I lived in a single room, a sort of 12 by 12 room. And um, there were a couple couple college kids that came in to help out. Uh, and, you know, so I'd, in the morning I'd fold up my bedding and throw it in the corner and they'd, they'd come in and we'd start you know, working and and then when they went home, I'd like I'd sleep on the floor. That was that was the kind of that's the kind of professional offices we had. So this was already 1988, and by that time, uh, my label had kind of taken off, and we had maybe I think five or ten releases. Um, one of them was a, a local band called Isocracy, and their the drummer was a real character. He'd he'd phoned me up um, all by, way back in '86 and asked me how to, to. He was still in high school at the time. He asked me how to get gigs and how this whole punk thing happened. And his name was John Kiffmeyer, but he also went by the name of Al Sobrante, which was taken from the name of his uh, suburb, which is El Sobrante, it means the leftover in Spanish. Anyway, this guy uh, had been, you know, sort of, you know, I'd been hanging out with him for a couple of years by now, and he, his, his band, Isocracy, had broken up, he, and he phoned me and said, hey, I got a new band, and we're, we're called Sweet Children, and there's these two 16-year-old kids that are playing in it with me, and they're, they're really great, and is there any place we could play? And at that and at the time, I said, well, there's not much going on, but uh, Trey, who, who at the time was still our drummer in the Lookouts, is, is organizing some, uh, some stupid party for, for a bunch of his high school mates on, on Friday night. And, you know, you're welcome to, welcome to come play that, but there's no money. It's a 140-mile drive, and it's, uh, you know, winter is setting in. Uh, it'll, I don't know if anybody will even, will sh even show up. And he said, well, we'll be there. first drummer was brought quite a lot to the band actually I think he sort of him more than Billy Joe and Mike sort of had ideas about production techniques he wanted to work quickly he knew they were a punk band and that you know time is money and if you spend weeks making an album but you, you can't do it for a few hundred dollars and also you know it was kind of keeping in with the spirit of what they were doing which was something raw and energetic and teenage he, he did all the driving and all the arranging of, of shows, everything at that time. He was about two years older than them. He was probably 18 uh, at the time. They were only 16. They were brilliant at, uh, at, at, at playing and at writing songs and performing, but, um, you know, as you would expect of a couple of 16-year-olds, couldn't do a lot else for themselves. And so Al pretty much arranged everything and told them to get in the in the Volkswagen bu uh, bus and drove. They, they turned up all ready to play and as it as it turned out because the weather was so bad and because it was so far up into the mountains from town none of the kids had bothered coming because there was there was actually five kids turned up and Billy and Mike and and Al from Sweet Children didn't express any disappointment or disillusionment at all they just came in and well, I, at first we had to set up a generator. There was no electricity, and we had to start a, a, a fire in the wood stove because it was freezing. And we lit a lot of candles. 
to sort of illuminate the occasion, and then they played what I still think is one of the shows that are of their lives, although, of course, they've played many sensational shows since then, but I've always said it was like the Beatles at Shea Stadium. I mean, they played that to these five curious kids who'd never seen a punk band before. They they played as just their their hearts out, and, and Billy had just kind of that, that right combination of arrogance and humility that you know just marked him out as a star even then at 16 he just like sang right to every one of those kids and you know thanked them for coming and asked them if they were enjoying the show and when they finished playing Billy came up to me and very kind of shyly asked well uh, what did you think did you did you like what we're doing and I just said well I want to do a record with you guys and he looked a little bit taken aback I don't think he was expecting that but he said oh okay man and that was that. I, I mentioned it to my partner in the record label at the time, and he, he was kind of dubious because, he, you know, and with good reason, because they were a bit poppier. Like, I made that comparison to the Beatles. That was the band they reminded me most of, and... You know, our, our our scene and the kind of records we've done so far were definitely more towards the punk end of things. I I had a feeling that a lot of the punks wouldn't probably like them that much and that it wouldn't sell that much. At that time, Green Day were still even having trouble getting gigs at, at Gilman Street because some of the more hardcore punks there would say, oh, no, they're they're too pop, they're not really punk. And, but still, I thought it was worthwhile. My, my partner said, well, we'll do it if you want. And about two weeks ahead of a release date, uh, we already had the, the records uh, ready to be pressed, but the band came to me and said, oh, we've changed our name. We don't want, we don't want to be Sweet Children anymore. And I, I just blew a gasket and said, you can't do that. That's ridiculous. I mean, you're not that well-known as it is, but you know, the handful of people that are going to buy your record you know, are, are looking for a record by Sweet Children what are you going to call yourself now? And they said, we're going to be Green Day. And I said, that doesn't even make any sense. That's a stupid name. And he says, well, it makes sense to us. And uh, and that was the first of, uh, I didn't have a lot of arguments with them over the years I worked with them, but it was probably because I learned from that one that it was pointless. You know, once they decided what was going to be, that was what was going to be. <laughs> came out on time with this completely unknown band called Green Day. Even the few hundred people that hung out at, uh, at, our, at Gilman Street had never even heard of. They said, who in the hell is Green Day? But uh, I thought Sweet Children were coming out with a record. But it, it came out and didn't, didn't sell very well at first. Um, and over the following year, the, the record kind of you know, got a little bit of a buzz. You know, some people slagged it off for being too poppy, but others said, hey, it's really catchy. And when we sold about 1,000 or 1,500 copies, which wasn't great, but wasn't bad for a seven inch at that time. And, uh, you know, it, it lived up to about what I expected um, in terms of sales, but in terms of uh, music, I thought it was brilliant. And I said, well, we're gonna do an album. And it was about exactly a year later that we, we did. Here we go again, infatuation touches me Just when I thought that it would be Oh, I'm dead again, it seems much fun in that mud I'm not sure exactly what you're thinking My touch has been a nightmare Can the door raise a picture I do my best to give up in the dark I think for anyone listening to the early Green Day, and especially the, the first album in particular. Because most people listen to it after the fact, if you know what I mean, you know, most people got into the band when Dookie happened. It's, 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 you kind of make allowances for the music, almost, and the, the fact that these were kids when they recorded the album. The first album cost $650 to record. It was done in roughly a day and a half with a little extra time for guitar and vocal overdubs. But even given all that, you would have to be, I think you'd have to be an idiot to listen to that album and not to see the kind of 
instinctive understanding that Billy Joe Armstrong as a principal songwriter has of the mechanics of writing a song. It was good enough for what it was at the time, which was sort of, you know, three 17-year-old boys making a record. Even uh, the, the production's kind of tinny, and it you know, doesn't compare to the, the production they have now. But at the same time, the band were kind of fully formed. The, Billy Joe's songwriting was already of a pretty high standard. And they kind of hit upon their own sound, which was something fast, stripped down, melodic, but with lots of harmonies and pop melodies. You can't really expect and shouldn't expect a band who are that young to really know themselves particularly well. So what you've really got on the first album, I think, is a collection of decent tunes rather than a collection of great songs by a great band. I think that they are good songs, but there's no real kind of necessary identity there yet. I think that record, probably more than any others, sort of owes some sort of debt to sort of 60s bands like the Kinks and the Who and 70s punk bands like the Buzzcocks or the Dickies. You know, it was recorded in a matter of days, basically. Um, most of the songs were put down in two days, and one weekend in San Francisco. So they worked quickly and it kind of, you can tell, but taking that into account, it's still a pretty strong album, really. Were I to hear the album when it came out, I think that I would definitely want to hear something else the band had done. It sounds patronising to say it, but I would say that the album is absolutely brimming with potential, but the potential would only be realised some years later. Thirty Nine Smooth, we reissued as a CD with um both of the EPs and another bonus track uh, in addition on it and since of course later on that's everybody bought CDs that's what they assume the album is the, the real album 39 Smooth is only 10 songs it was kind of a punk thing in those days you know it was it was considered kind of immoral to to put out a a CD that could conceivably hold 73 minutes of music and only have 10 or 12 songs on it so you had to pad it out with all sorts of other things. I don't think I ever set foot in one of their recording sessions. And I can't remember exactly why. Uh, I think that they asked my partner, David Hayes, to, to come in with them. And all I know really is what David told me, is that they, they came in, played their songs, and were out of there really quickly. You know, very rarely had to do anything over. You know, it was a, a, rec a record producer's dream in the sense that they knew all their stuff perfectly, they didn't have to do retakes, it was very cheap to do, I mean, just, and, and they produced some, some really great sounds and really great songs. Um, I trusted most bands. If, uh, if I thought that a band was good enough to make a record, I didn't think they needed to, to be babysat in a studio. We also had a couple of uh, producer engineers that we worked with at that time that I, I trusted implicitly. Uh, one was Kevin Army, the other was um, Andy Ernst, who, who did all of the early Green Day stuff. And I, I knew he knew more, way more about it than I did. And if, if I sent a band to him, I knew that he would, he would do a good job and he wouldn't waste time or money. And, you know, some, some bands really wanted me to be there to sort of hold their hands and encourage them. Other bands wanted me nowhere near the studio, and I was fine either way. Can we find a way so that you can stay? They would be living a, a sort of hand-to-mouth existence, really. Because at that point, you know, they, they would get minimal amount for shows. You know, they would get enough to pay for the petrol to the next show. The decision that they would have to make then is, is, is do they then fall into jobs that they don't want uh, in order to earn a living, or do they try and make a living from the band? 
and they decided to opt for the latter and try to make a living from the band. I mean, they didn't have much in the way of income, so when they weren't touring or playing shows, they would have to do sort of, you know, menial jobs, wherever they could. Most of the jobs were short-lived because they would go back on tour again. After, after the debut album was released, they went on a 45-day US tour, and, uh, which is incredible. The first tour in the summer of 1990 was a completely DIY uh, punk rock kind of tour. I think Al probably organized most of it. By this time, um, there's kind of an informal network had, had sprung up thanks to the scene that had, was, was beginning to grow around the country where you could just phone up or write to, to people in a variety of cities and ask them to set up a show at their local club or often in their house. Um, a few bands had done this, Operation Ivy uh, from, had, was the first from our scene that went out across America in 1988 and came back with all these stories of what it was like out there and how kids were starting across America were starting to hear about our bands. Um, so by the time uh, Green Day tried it in June of 1990, there was sort of a, I wouldn't say well-worn, but slightly worn trail that led across America. By the end of that year, I think they'd played in something like 48 of the 50 states of America. I guess the ones they hadn't played in were Hawaii and Alaska, but they'd played everywhere. And, they, and so instead of thinking, well, this is our little band and we do it for fun, as soon as the debut album was recorded, they said, okay, well, let's try and see if we can take this a little bit further. And didn't look for handouts, didn't look for handouts, didn't look for help, just slept on people's floors, played to, you know, 50 people a night and went on tour. That was the kind of the way those kind of tours worked. You didn't know when you came to, to town whether it'd be a, a full-fledged club with a professional sound system or somebody's basement or um, if there'd even be a working PA or if the police would shut it down or if somebody's parents would come in and say, all right, you've played long enough, stop your noise. Uh, that's, that's the way it went. They made money by selling merchandise. They were quite sort of astute when it came to that. They printed up T-shirts. Or even if they didn't print up t-shirts, they had stencils or, or prints which they could take along. Kids would turn up at shows with their own t-shirts or shorts. The band would just charge them for the print. By the time they came back to the Bay Area in, in August, they were kind of like returning conquering heroes um, everybody was really happy to see them they were starting to draw a pretty big crowd uh, in back in the Bay Area I'm sure at least a few hundred people came out to see their first show back and right then of course was when Al dropped his bombshell about uh, I'm leaving the band had been going for a couple of years they'd been gigging they'd had a record or two out but they were, they were by no means huge they were known within the East Bay scene they were known in and around San Francisco, and the word was kind of starting to spread slowly in America through fanzines, but really they were still at the sort of bottom rung of the ladder, and he probably didn't see much of a sort of a financial future there for the band. You know, he was invaluable to the band. I think he often gets over, overlooked now. I saw this article in Rolling Stone last summer where, you know, if you'd read that, you'd, you'd think he didn't even exist, and he's not even, doesn't even get a mention, and yet, I'm pretty sure the band would not have got through those first couple of years without him. But the thing is, there was kind of a, a socioeconomic and cultural kind of divide between Al and, uh, and Billy and Mike. And although they worked really great together, I mean, to, to Billy and Mike, music and playing in a band was their life. I mean, there was, that was it. Um, Al had other ambitions and other ideas. I mean, I put it down to, you know, there being sort of blue collar working class and, and, and Al being, you know, more middle class, you know, from a more prosperous background. You know, you've been, been on tour for two or three years with a couple of friends, sleeping on floors, traveling in a van, no money, eating bad food, drinking lots. After two or three years, it can get quite tiring. And he probably thought, well, you know, that was great, but maybe it's time to grow up a little bit. He had this idea he wanted to go to college, and not just go to college, but have a full-on university experience living 
living there and becoming part of it. And so at the end of the summer of 1990, after they'd done their first tour and were really starting to get some recognition, he told Billy and Mike that, well, I'm going to go away to university for two, two years to, to have this university experience, as he put it. And so we're going to have to put the band on hold for two years. Uh, you know, Billy and Mike were devastated, uh, Billy told me. I mean, Billy was just 18 at the time and had just left school. And, I mean, he, he later told me that, you know, his whole life was, you know, kind of around this band, and he, he, couldn't, he couldn't even comprehend what Al was on about. And at the same time, he had, had said he had this romantic idea that the, the band you know, it doesn't break up or, you know, you don't just have somebody quit and replace him or it's kind of like a gang. You just you stuck together till the bitter end. And so he didn't, he thought, well, it's, it's over. And he was heartbroken. Um, and so Al went off to, to university about 300 miles north and he, um, and nothing happened for a couple of months. And Around that time, you know, Trey from our, our band had become increasingly inactive because we'd kind of scattered too into different locations. We'd played our last show in July of 1990. We didn't know it was our last show, but we'd, we'd done some recording. And in fact, uh, Billy had come in to, to play with us. He played lead guitar and sang backup vocals on our last recordings. And uh, I guess that would be the first time that Billy and Trey ever would play together. And later that autumn, uh, Trey moved down to the Bay Area to, to attend college. And somewhere he and Billy ran into each other again, and, and I guess one of them proposed that they try jamming together. And next thing I knew, uh, Trey was going to play a show with, with Green Day as their fill-in drummer. Want to be your dominated little flesh. Want to be the one who takes the pain. Can spank me when I do not behave. Smack me in the forehead with a chain. Cause I love feeling dirty. And I love feeling cheap. And I love when you hurt me. So drive the staples deep. He was already aware of Billy Joe and Mike because they hung around Gilman together. They were much of the same age. They were kind of shared the same sense of humour. They were kind of, you know, budding rebels, if you like. But Trey brought a kind of new sort of energy to the band, really. He sort of contributed a lot um, musically, but, but also just in terms of um, the dynamic, really. He would do the things which the others kind of didn't dare do. He would come into a so social situation and just shake things up. I think that Trey Cool is pound for pound one of the best drummers in modern music in the sense that he, he brings a tightness and a sense of rhythm and roll, if you will, a sense of bounce and energy to Green Day's music, that while they weren't entirely lacking that before, it really brought the playing to a, to a kind of whole new level, that real knuckle tightness. The minute that they started, I, 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 I was just, you know, it was, it was almost like seeing Green Day for the first time again because it was a whole new dimension. You know, by this time, Trey had become a really excellent drummer, and I kind of knew that he was exactly what they needed and that he was going to be a great part of the, the band, and it was kind of made me sad and happy at the same time because I knew it would probably mean the end of the lookouts, but I knew it also meant that Green Day was going to carry on and, and be even greater. The first thing that Trey worked on was during the, I guess it was the autumn of 1991, so about a year after he joined the band. and um, Actually they did a demo in the spring of 91 of five new songs and then and I thought they were ready to do an album, and they came and said, well, actually, that's all the songs we have. So it was postponed, and in the autumn of 91, they went in to, 
to to record re-record those five songs and five more, and that be- became the Kerplunk album. <laughs> This, this time I think they took about, well, it might have been two or three days. I, I know it cost $1,500 for, for the second album as opposed to the first one, which was about six or $700. $675, I think, the first album cost. That, that's how fast they, they, they whipped through their, their sessions. By that time, our record label was getting successful enough. It wasn't quite a shoestring operation anymore. We could have afford to spend one or 2000 instead of... 500 or so. I think they were starting to take themselves a little bit more seriously musically. I mean, it's still incredibly cheap. Um, there was a kind of a, a cachet attached in those days in the punk scene to being able to do your record really fast and really cheap. And I mean, the bands almost competed with each other. Like, well, we did ours in three hours, man. Well, ours is only two and a half, man. Uh, it was kind of, kind of, in a way, it's kind of cute, but in a way, it's kind of sad too because some some great performances got only a kind of a half-assed kind of recording as a result. You know, there's, I mean, you can overdo things as as many mainstream bands do, but there's such a thing as not given something it's due also. first time I really had a chance um, to, to assess it was when I took the tape down to Los Angeles for, for mastering and we had a really good mastering guy down there who'd been in the business for 30, 40 years and well, um, I used to sit around and hear stories about him of you know the, the 60s and of Frank Zappra and uh, Beach Boys and Frank Sinatra all these kind of things and um, and you know sort of in the middle of it, we'd managed to master a record. So it was, it was kind of like we mastered Green Day like that. We kind of just sort of went through it, and and I was sort of focusing on the components sounds rather than the overall picture. And and he made me a cassette. The mastering engineer made me a cassette of the of the album to to listen to back home on ordinary speakers, not these big giant studio speakers. And so I put it in my Walkman when I got on the plane to go back to, to Berkeley. And it was just as the plane was starting to taxi and, um, and the first chords of the, of the album, and it was 2,000 light years away, kicked in. And it was, it was a scary feeling, it really was, because I just suddenly, I, I, I realized this is something way bigger than I had ever bargained for. When they made Kaplunk, um, obviously Trey Cool had joined the band, they toured with him and they'd really refined what they were doing. Billy Joe was sort of really finding his own voice as a songwriter, I think. There is a definite sense of musical progression in terms of, of the, the ability to write songs. The obvious example would be uh, Welcome to Paradise, which is a song that then subsequently made it onto Dookie, the next album. Welcome to Paradise. That was a song about sort of being out in the world, leaving home, having no money, being mildly depressed about it, but also, you know, having to get on with life. Um, that all came through in the record. The songs were just way stronger than on 39 Smooth, they were more melodic, 
more emotional, more powerful really. Again, the album was recorded quickly, but the production's slightly better and the songs are so much better. And that comes from, from touring for two or three years. They had a, a real bond there, which, um, you know, if maybe if Al Sobrante was still in the band, they would have made a similar album to the first, whereas Kaplunk was a kind of um, a step up, if you like. And that's the album that got passed around quite a bit in the UK. And that's when this sort of started to make the name internationally, albeit in a really sort of underground way. It cemented their reputation as being ones to keep an eye on. And people around them uh, and who got to see them were becoming very, very excited by the band. The live performances at the time were said to be absolutely brilliant. And, the, the, you know, the sense of confidence and the sense of swagger was, was coming into it. The fact that they realised that they were good at what they did and they, and they were kind of being appreciated by people. So Kaplunk is a good record by a band who would become great. When that first Green Day record came out in January of 92, it, it sold 10,000 the first day. And we'd never sold more than 2,000 records in an entire year before, the, before that. So it was, a, it was quite a shock. And, and it kept on selling. For most of the spring of 92, you know, Green Day kept selling, Operation Ivy kept selling, it was still our biggest seller, they, they, you know, they were, Green Day hadn't even yet passed them up, and the label kept growing and it was still in my bedroom and we were all having a, a great time, you know, Green Day were playing more and more, they were touring, they went over to, to Europe and to the UK for the first time. But they, they were doing then in Europe and, and the UK pretty much the same kind of very grassroots DIY thing that they'd been doing in the, in the, US, in the USA or in earlier years. And it took a while to catch on, but it did. They built up an audience. Uh, they did 65 shows in three months. They weren't really paid for the shows. They toured around in vans. They didn't bring equipment over. They brought albums to sell. They brought a screen so they could print T-shirts as and when needed to be, and that's how they made their money. But it was quite a culture shock for them, although they, they adapted well. Obviously, there's things like the climate. You know, coming into a British winter when you're used to the California sunshine is going to be pretty, uh, pretty jarring. They're also, they, you know, they, they played squats in Denmark, in Germany. They went to Spain. Um, they just roughed it, basically. To give you some idea of what the tour was like, Billy Joe Armstrong co contracted lice from this tour. The conditions were so, let's be kind, let's say they were rustic. The conditions were rustic. They played in, uh, in some working men's club in, in Wigan. Where, where they notoriously enacted, it was on Christmas Eve, and they notoriously reenacted the, the birth of Jesus with all of, all of them playing parts. Mike Dirnt was the anorexic Santa. Uh, Billy Joe Armstrong was schizophrenic, three wise men who narrated the tale. Uh, they had one of their friends play the baby Jesus. They got a load of mints from Tesco so they could make a placenta. And I guess some people were scandalized, other people were highly amused. toured as far out into Poland, uh, almost to the Russian border. I, I remember I came out there a few weeks later with a, dif a different band thinking, I, I bet you no East Bay punk rock band has ever been to this this far east and this, uh, you know, we're practically in, in Russia now. And, the, and I look up at the water tower of this, this small town, I think it was called Bialystok in, in eastern Poland, and there's Green Day spray painted on the on the town water tower. They'd already been there. They didn't get a lot of publicity out of it, but what they did in 1991 by tour in Europe was just sort of uh, start lots of little fires, if you like, across Europe, which when they came back, you know, were, were sort of 
burning brighter, if you like. They built all these small followings in little pockets in, in places like Wigan or Newport. C came to London, played some shows here. Um, and it's probably not recognised enough, but that's part of the reason why they became so huge worldwide was because they were able to go to all these different countries and do that. I know that Green Day themselves thought, think that, they, that, that what really made them initially was that European tour. It, it sharpened them up and it made them realise that, that this is what they wanted to do. No matter how much they had to struggle to do it, this is what they wanted to do. I didn't see quite as much of them in, in 92 as, as, uh, as I was used to. As it used to be they'd come around to the, well, the grandiosely titled label headquarters, i.e. my room, on a regular basis, probably two or three times, a, four times a week, just to hang out and ask questions and tell me things and gossip about the other bands and, and so on. And, you know, now sometimes I go, I go weeks without seeing them. But, you know, every time they played at Gilman, it was still like, you know, really, really great, uh, you know, kind of old home night. They were also starting to play at other bigger clubs around the Bay Area, and, and the crowds were starting to come. It was, you know, I could see, you know, things are changing. Green Day had come from a place in the underground where they had managed to sell 50,000 records in the States without virtually any publicity, virtually word of mouth. Uh, the label, uh, as we found out when we got on Lookout, uh, hardly sent out any promo copies. They didn't put ads in, in uh, zines or magazines back then. So Green Day had pretty much done it on their own, by, by themselves. There was no marketing. There was virtually no advertising except for a couple of punk fanzines. Our advertising budget was usually about 100 or $200. And we'd mail out records to a few radio stations and fanzines. That was, that was it. And if people bought it, great. If they didn't, well try something different next time. Lookout was a very small label. For a label uh, operating at the level that Lookout was, to sell 50,000 copies was really pushing the limits of what they could do. And I know that Green Day were going out on tour uh, at that point, maybe 91 or 92, I think, 93. They weren't able to find the records in stores. Their distribution wasn't that great. And Lookout really didn't help them to book shows. Um, they needed a more professional way of doing things than they had been. Our scene was now getting enough attention that, that I, I, I knew that there would be some interest from the, from the big companies. One, one band from our, our area had already signed a, a major label contract. Um, with uh, a subsidiary of Slash, Warner Brothers, and and it hadn't come out too well. I mean, they'd made a record, spent a lot of money on it, and then it, it had bombed. You know, they'd sold a thousand copies or something, I and mean, we could have sold a lot more than that. And so I kind of took that as a cautionary tale. You, you know, you can't make that leap too fast. If they had come to me and said, we're thinking of signing with a major label, should we do it? I would have said don't do it because they were doing great on their own. If you're on an indie label selling 50,000 records, you know, maybe you go to a major label and sell twice that many. You're considered a failure in major label standards, but you'd be a huge indie band. But if you're going to sell 10 million records, yeah, sign with the major label, but you can't predict that. It was around that same time, maybe spring of 93 or summer. That was probably spring of 93, people around the scene who, who liked to gossip anyway, but would start coming to me and say, well, what, you know, what are you going to do if Green Day goes to a major label? And, uh, or, you know, they're, they're not going to stay with you, are they? I mean, they're like, so they're getting, they're getting really popular. And, I, you know, it was the first I'd heard of it. By that point, it sold 50,000 of their first two albums each on Lookout Records. That was all that the major record companies needed to know really. They saw a band, you know, they might not understand the music, but they would look at the figures. He's a band selling 50,000 records without MTV, without 
Spin or Rolling Stone or NME in the UK or Kerrang. At this point, they weren't getting written about. But yet they had a huge following. So obviously the major labels started sniffing around. For anyone who doesn't know, major label feeding friends is a kind of it's kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy to the degree that if two if if two labels are after you, then every label will then become after you and they'll all be after you. Sometime I guess it must have been no, still probably late spring. Somebody said said to me, "Oh, you know, they're 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 talking to like you know the the, the major labels are coming around to talk to Green Day now." And um, and the next time I saw Trey, I said, "Well, what's is this any any truth to this?" And he says, "Well, we're talking to some to a management firm about you know what kind of what we want to do next." And and I said, well, you should, why don't you talk to me about it and we, we could talk about it together and, you know, I have some ideas too. And, and I kind of said, well, why don't you get Billy and Mike down and we'll have a, have a meeting. And so we, we sort of all sat down at the local cafe and within a few minutes it was became clear they were more than just talking. They'd already pretty much agreed a deal with this management firm and... Who you know a management firm who were you know determined to get them a major label deal, and so I mean I knew at that point there wasn't much I could do about it. In the end, they decided to sign a reprise, which is part of Warner's, because they were impressed by their A and R man there, Rob Cavallo, who was you know he was a, he was he was a young guy. He was qu he was quite newish, but he'd sort of made a name for himself. He was also. Um, a producer, so he was able to offer that service as well. Yeah, I think he loved them for much the same reasons that I did. You know, he, he was a big Beatles fan. He saw the connection there. He he saw their potential, and you know, he he told me and he told the band. You know, I don't really want to change anything. We we'll just get some, you know, maybe some better production qualities. But other than that, we we want you to keep on doing what you're doing. And they, I think they made the the record label made no attempt that I know of to, to really change their sound or to market them in any different way. They they just kind of did really continued on a bigger scale with just what I'd done, you know. He put them in a room and turned the microphones on and let them go. It's probably one out of maybe 50 or 100 bands that thinks they're ready to make that leap is, but they were one that was ready. I went to a train 